Thank you so much uh, for joining us. And I think uh, this uh, lecture is being recorded, so it will be possible for the students to listen. Now um, we're in a kind of transitional period between uh, online and offline teaching. Uh, we started to teach uh, offline again, but then again, some of it to turn online again. So the students are kind of both confused and uh, they are having classes these days, but uh, we'll make the, the talk available for them. Uh, okay. Just a few words about uh, our department and our university. So uh, Danny and I and the others here, we belong to the Department of Asian Studies. Uh, we have approximately 300 students majoring in either Chinese studies, Japanese studies, Korean studies, or Indian and Indonesian studies. Mm -hmm. um, the majority of our students, they, they study double major. Actually, it's, a kind of, it's kind of compulsory to take a double major. Uh, so uh, they, combined, they combined the studies with international relations, political science, sociology, history, and so forth. Uh, actually, the combination of uh, Asian studies and international relations is very popular. I think we share approximately 70 or 80 students um, hmm. uh, in, in both programs. I myself, I also teach a course in international relations about the IR in Asia. So uh, this will definitely uh, be of interest uh, to my students in class, and I will send them the link for the talk later on. So we are very honored to have you here uh, online. Uh, next time it will be uh, offline, hopefully. And uh, let me introduce uh, our speaker uh, uh, shortly. So uh, uh, Brendan Cannon is Assistant Professor of International Security at the Institute of International and Civil S Security Khalifa University, Abu Dhabi, UAE. He earned a PhD in political science with an emphasis on international relations at the University of Utah, USA in 2009. His research focused on the nexus of international relations, security studies, geopolitics, and the strate strategic interplay between Asia, West and East, with e Eastern Africa. Prior to moving to Khalifa University, Brendan held academic positions in Nairobi, Kenya, and Hargesia, uh, Somaliland. He was a visiting scholar at Sekei University, Tokyo in 2018, and project professor at the University of Tokyo in 2019. He has published on topics related to regional security and geopolitics, the arms industry and military power in sub-Saharan Africa, power projection capabilities, and the interests of external states such as Japan and China vis-a-vis -vis Africa. And uh, just to add a personal note, uh, this connection between uh, Professor Cannon and ourselves was made thanks to Japan. Uh, we, uh, we, we asked from the Japanese uh, culture attache at the embassy here in Israel to, to try to make some connection. And through the, through the Japanese embassy in the UAE, we managed to find each other. So um, usually it's the Americans who mediate between Israel and other parts of the world. But this time it's Japan who mediated between, between us. So uh, Brendan, we'll go forward with your uh, talk and perhaps we'll open the stage la later for Q&A. Sure, Please. thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's right. You, the uh, Japanese did reach out to me from, from their embassy here in Abu Dhabi. I know um, uh, some of the people there and uh, I was delighted when they did so. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's a nice, interesting um, way of going into the presentation, I guess, since this is going to be uh, quite a bit about Japan. Um, so we're going to look at this interplay between East Asia uh, and Eastern Africa. But I'm going to uh, telescope a little bit. We're going to take a big picture view, and then we're going to telescope in and look at some of the actions of smaller and medium powers um, that aren't necessarily from uh, East Asia, uh, so the UAE, um, Turkey, and others in the region, and then um, and then look at China, what it's doing, and then look at Japan, what it's doing, and then kind of telescope back out and, and talk about what all this, this means. So I hope that's okay. Um, again, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I wish it could have been in person. I agree with you, um, Nissen and Danny, that let's do it offline next time uh, in person um, uh, in Jerusalem. And of course, you're always welcome here in, in, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we've got a nice picture of the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Um, uh, and this, and if you're teaching about the Indo-Pacific, you'll be familiar with this map. Uh, you know, this, this is um, the world uh, in the 20th century, and certainly the 19th was largely a 
a Pacific and Atlantic um, world. It's increasingly becoming an Indo-Pacific world. Uh, of course, I live in Abu Dhabi, so I look at the Indian Ocean, um, or at least a, a, an inlet of it, um, uh, on a daily basis. And uh, this is where I think a lot of this action is happening, the geopolitics of, of the Indo-Pacific. Um, Right here, looking at maps, and I love maps, you can see why sea lanes are so important um, between, say, the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, between Japan and China and East Asia um, and the Indian Ocean. Okay. Now, I'm also, my research is, is, is focused on, on an area of the Indian Ocean that is often less studied when it comes to East Asian IR um, and East Asian uh, studies in general. Uh, that's Eastern Africa. Um, uh, and and as, as Nissen noted, uh, I've spent um, a bit of time in, in both Kenya as well as Somaliland, uh, which is a, a de facto independent republic, um, but unrecognized internationally. In fact, today is its 30th uh, Independence Day celebration, by the way. Um, and so I spent quite a bit of time in Hargeisa, the capital of Somaliland. Uh, now, along with this, I've, I've spent a, a, a lot of time in, in, in Uganda and Ethiopia, Tanzania, South Sudan, etc. So, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know the region really well, um, but I know the region a, a fair amount, um, and, and it's where my, my great interest uh, in it comes from. And I see a lot of an increasing connection between East Asia and Eastern Africa. Uh, all wrapped up with these big geopolitical um, and international relations uh, goings on, if you will. Um, the Belt and Road Initiative of China, the Indo-Pacific vision or strategy of Japan, et cetera. Okay. Um, if we're talking Indo-Pacific, uh, this, this is, a, this is a, a nascent grouping of states. Um, generally, uh, the, 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 the big players, uh, there's four, India, Australia, uh, Japan and the United States. They form what's called the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue or the Quad. Um, this has been around, well, since 2007 actually, but it, uh, it, was, it was somewhat of a stillborn birth um, because it folded up shop shortly thereafter and was only resurrected um, in say 2015. Uh, it's largely response to China. I don't think anybody is really gonna quibble with that. It's largely response to the growing influence and power of China across the Indo-Pacific, but particularly in the South China Sea, of course. Um, this is what concerns Japan the most, and that, that is elucidating in that Japan has its security concerns about China, which aren't necessarily shared by India, um, uh, but it has its own security concerns, major security concerns with China. Um, Australia shares somewhat more of Japan's than India's, but it, Australia is an, is an Indian and Pacific country as well. And then, of course, there's the US, um, uh, which given its power and size and uh, traditional role, is, uh, um, has security interests across the commons or the oceans, if you will. Um, looking at these maps, what are they? Well, on the left, uh, we're looking at, uh, at least it's my left, I hope, I hope it's your left too, <laughs> um, the gray map, uh, we're looking at uh, India's um, uh, Indo-Pacific. Uh, this is their kind of remit, the area uh, that they are concerned with, and Eastern Africa is very much a part of this. Um, uh, in Japan, uh, on the, the other map here, you see some major areas of interest, um, some major areas of projects. There's Southeast Asia, there's South Asia, and there's Eastern Africa. Um, so Eastern Africa is very much a part of Japan's Indo-Pacific vision. Um, whoops, excuse me one second. There we go. Uh, the U.S. is a little bit different. Uh, their Indo-Pacific area of responsibility is covered by Pacific Command in Hawaii. This stretches from uh, what somebody colloquially will said as Hollywood to Bollywood, so uh, Los Angeles to Mumbai. Um, Eastern Africa is not included. Uh, Africa is divided up under multiple commands. And that's the way the U.S. has looked at this. It's, it's, it's got its you know, economic stuff over here. It's got its military things here, et cetera. And so um, it's, Eastern Africa positively does not form part of this um, Indo-Pacific. And then the final map is Australia's, which I'm going to talk very little about uh, today. 
Um, here's the Belt and Road Initiative uh, with the Maritime Silk Road uh, in purple, uh, at least purple to me, I might be colorblind. And then there's the blue to the north, um, which is the road portion of China's Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, you can see very clearly that the Indian Ocean plays a major role here um, and that uh, Kenya and Djibouti in particular are noted on the map of Africa. But we'll talk a lot about China's um, projects in Eastern Africa and how they blanket that region. Um, look, it's, it's a huge area we're talking about here. Uh, you know, you can fit China and the United States and, um, and India and a bunch of other countries inside the continent of Africa and you've still got room left over. Uh, so the area of Eastern Africa, particularly if you include Mozambique to the south, all the way to Ethiopia and Eritrea in the north is huge. Um, it is highly diverse, uh, um, both in terms of geography as well as, as, well as people. Um, and, and, and so making claims about Eastern Africa in general, general is pretty, pretty difficult. Nonetheless, I'm going to do it <laughs> for the purposes of this project uh, and this presentation today. One of the things that's in short supply in Eastern Africa um, is ports. Uh, this is why I've got a picture of the port of Mombasa here. Uh, deep, natural deep water ports are in very, very limited supply across the continent of Africa, around, around the, the continent of Africa. Um, and that coupled with a uh, very small number of navigable rivers, almost zero, uh, um, mean that Africa's um, uh, economy has, um, has had difficulties in a way that, uh, that, uh, that the economies such as that of, uh, that developed in Western Europe with its riverine systems and, and deep water ports, or even the United States, um, it's, it's happened on a very different trajectory uh, for, for, this, for these reasons, as well as many, many others, of course. Um, ports are important, uh, not, not only because they're few and far between in Eastern Africa, uh, but, um, um, but also because they are, they, can, they are dual use, all right? Uh, ports can double potentially as both sites of commerce, as well as um, strategic sites. Dock a naval vessel um, here, you can unload uh, multiple types of cargo at ports, et cetera, et cetera. And because they're so uh, few and far between, we're really talking Mombasa in Kenya and Djibouti in, 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 um, in Djibouti itself, uh, as the major ports in East Africa, followed by, by Dar es Salaam and in Maputo, way in the south of Mozambique. I mean, that's it, for this entire, entire region. And so ports have been a location of contestation. I um, mean, there's a lot of port building, a lot of port management project, projects ongoing, and um, a lot of refurbishment or expansion ongoing in ports, okay? These are the four basic uh, points uh, or, or, or topics I'm going to talk about. What's the impetus for involvement in Eastern Africa by external states? I've already briefly touched on this. I'll continue in that vein for a while. Uh, the uh, security or insecurity um, uh, of engendered by small and medium power competition in the region. China's Belt and Road Initiative um, and the perception amongst many countries to include Japan that that um, is bringing China unheralded uh, power and influence in places like East Africa. And then the reaction of Japan to this, which is really a continuation of projects and ways of doing business in East Africa that have been ongoing for decades. So those are the four major things I'm going to talk about. But let's, uh, let's, let's go to the city of Djibouti, the port of Djibouti to begin with, and then kind of talk about why and how uh, this location in particular has become so important. We had a problem with piracy in the Gulf of Aden and the Western Indian Ocean about 10 years ago, a really serious problem. Uh, movies were made about it, like Captain Phillips. Uh, and, and so, um, there was a task force put together that is still operational um, to bring this scourge of piracy under control. Now, Djibouti was a, is a former French colony. The French have always had um, a naval presence there and a military base there. Um, after the attacks of 9-11 on the United States, the United States then leased um, a base from the French in Djibouti and have been there ever since. But um, after 2009, uh, um, the Japanese 
built their first overseas base or military installation, as I like to call it, base is a bit of a, a strong term, um, in Djibouti. And the Chinese did as well. And the Chinese um, base is truly a military base. And if, if, if you grew up in the Cold War, we're talking about that type of base. Um, it's, it's, it's the real deal, um, along with a naval uh, presence or a naval port um, that is growing in size. And, uh, you know, along with these, the Italians are there, the French are there, I already mentioned, um, the Germans have a contingency there, the Spanish do as well. The Saudis have talked about building a port uh, and, and, and base there as well for years, they've never done it yet. Um, and on top of all of this, uh, until 2018, the Durali multi-purpose port, which you can see on the map here, was run by DP World out of Dubai. Um, they were removed forcibly in 2018 um, uh, it, was a, it was a legal issue. Uh, the Djiboutian government uh, made claims. Um, the London court decided against the Djiboutian government. So they kicked out DP World forcibly and a Chinese company came in to run the place. And they are still running that uh, port and expanding it as well. So it's, it's quite interesting how um, an international event such as piracy brought in a number of players, particularly from East Asia, who continue to remain in this very, very small statelet. Um, and if, we, if you look at the literature on particularly Chinese power and influence, Djibouti is always mentioned. Now I have um, a few problems with that, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. I think that the perception of Chinese influence and power in Eastern Africa is probably exaggerated. I think the importance of Djibouti in China's overall strategy is exaggerated. Um, but I think it was certainly, the, the, the anti-piracy mission certainly offered an opportunity to both Japan and China to do things that were outside of their comfort zone, at least back then. Now, along with these, uh, I would call them great powers, China, um, Japan certainly is a great economic power, um, uh, the United States, um, France, et cetera, we have um, some smaller and medium powers uh, who are operating in the region. Um, the picture on the bottom left, at least my left, is the new Turkish embassy in Mogadishu in Somalia. They have a huge waterfront um, complex there. They also opened a military training facility or a base um, in 2017 to train the Somali National Army. This is a country that had really no presence in sub-Saharan Africa in 2000. Um, I think it had 12 embassies across the country, across the continent of 50, what, 56 countries. Um, it now has something like 48 embassies um, in, in Africa. Uh, the picture on the bottom right is, uh, shows a UAE jet fighter. Um, the UAE, of course, was involved in Yemen in a Saudi-led coalition against the Houthi um, from 2015 to 2019. They utilized basing facilities in Eritrea at Assab to um, uh, resupply and redeploy uh, to Yemen, uh, made great effect uh, with that there. And then the top picture on the right above the jet fighter is the uh, port of Berbera in Somaliland. This is a port um, that was originally uh, uh, dredged by the British um, back when it was British Somaliland. Um, the Soviets did a bit more work in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, the Americans completed a massive runway at the airport next to it in the 1980s. In fact, it's so large, the space shuttle can land at that airport in Berbera in case there's, it's cloudy weather in Texas or Florida. Uh, so nice little fun fact there. And the, Berbera has become the site of DP World's uh, new um, base of operations, if you will, in, in uh, the Horn of Africa. Was removed from Durale port in Djibouti, as I noted, in 2018. Prior to that, it signed a contract to refurbish this port on right on the Gulf of Aden in 2015. And then the picture on the uh, upper left is the port of Mombasa, uh, the largest in East Africa. And uh, we'll see that ha that has a lot to do with both Japan and China in the coming slides. There's been a lot of talk um, given the actions of countries like Qatar, uh, the UAE, Turkey, um, relatively new players um, in, in, in the region. 
uh, um, about what all this means and their zones of influence and protecting investments. And there's just a massive amount of hyperbole, I would call it, out there about this. Um, and it's, uh, it's quite interesting. You, you start to see maps like the one on the left here, which is actually a Turkish map, um, but you know, showing a Turkish base in Qatar, uh, um, a Turkish base in Somalia and Mogadishu, and then this uh, Suakin Island, which is the island you see on the bottom here, which is an old Ottoman island, uh, or it's an old Ottoman town on a Sudanese island in the Red Sea, which, the, um, which Erdogan, um, President Erdogan of Turkey, uh, you can see him here with former Sudanese President uh, Omar al-Bashir, he signed a deal with Bashir back in 2017 or so to restore the old Ottoman uh, town. Now, for whatever reason, that became, that, that turned into, oh, well, they're going to build a naval base here, and then Qatar is going to fund it and all this. And so there's lots of fun stuff out there about all of this. And, and then it doesn't help that <laughs> countries like Turkey themselves make maps like this and show their zones of influence, um, which of course makes people here in the UAE very nervous. Um, and, and so it, it's, it, and all of this is happening. Um, I shouldn't say it's all happening. It's all being written about as if the countries where these, where these bases and ports and things are located don't have any say in all of this. So the Africans have been kind of written out of this, um, uh, whether it's the Somalilanders or whether it's the Sudanese, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not the topic of this conversation, but I've got articles and, and, and other presentations I can give you on that, on that topic as well. And you end up with maps like this one in the middle, which start to show all sorts of scary developments. Um, uh, you've got Emirati flags papered all over this. You've got Turkish flags papered all over it. And then of course up in Djibouti, You've got American, Chinese, French, and Japanese, as well as the Saudi flag. As I mentioned, um, uh, the Saudis have talked about building a base there, but um, they haven't done so. And again, all of this comes down to uh, geopolitics. It comes down to the ability of states such as China or Japan to project force um, to nodes like Djibouti. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, my argument has been um, with what ships and with what then and with what material. Um, and so the same, the same thing goes for the UAE, the same thing goes for Turkey. Um, and so with the possible exception of the United States, which even in its case has limited resources and limited interests, believe it or not, um, you know, some of this is, 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 is going a bit far or it's a bit far-fetched. But it does show a general trend over the past 10 years in particular um, of a scramble you will, for influence and power, um, contracts, uh, both in commercial um, and, 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 and political ties in the Eastern African region. Now, there's some of what I've said may sound like, well, why are all these people doing this? And, 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 and is there any usefulness in any of this for the states themselves, the Ethiopias, the Somalias, the Kenyans, et cetera? And my answer is yes, there actually is in many respects. Um, I've put up a map of Ethiopia here and you can see quite clearly that, that it's a landlocked state. Um, it's a huge state, state of uh, over 100 million people or almost 100 million people. Um, and it's reliant on that little red dot at the top, Djibouti, that port of Djibouti for 95% of its imports and exports, okay? And so, um, you know, this is set to change as relations with Eritrea become somewhat better, but it's going to be a while. And it's one of the reasons why the port of Berbera potentially holds a lot of potential. Um, Berbera, if you look in this map, is just, is just due north of Hargeisa um, on the Gulf of Aden there. And so it would help to service a lot of the eastern Ethiopian regions. So there, there is some real efficacy and reason for DP World, for example, there's some commercial reasons why DP World would come and build or excuse me, operate and, um, and manage and uh, um, expand the port in Berbera beyond the strategic, which is what's being talked about so much. Um, there's, there's, there's commercial value there and there's a reason for it. And so thus, here we have the moribund uh, port of Berbera as it is now. Um, it, the, the whole area needs to be dredged. Uh, um, the, the, the port will expand all the way up to the top of the picture here. 
Um, and you see the signing deal uh, that was done in, I believe, 2016 between a representative of DP World, um, the foreign minister of Somaliland in the middle, and then uh, I believe it's the foreign minister of Ethiopia on the left. Uh, the picture on the bottom right is actually a picture of me at the port back in 2018. I went up and visited. Um, so I've got the red hard hat on there along with the others and was shown around. And uh, when I was there in 2018, uh, the port was in phase zero. I said, what does that mean? <laughs> and, uh, and they said, well, we've got to refurbish what's already here. And then we begin the expansion project. And, and, and my understanding is that uh, that um, uh, that has proceeded apace, and it's much larger than it was when I was there. But there's no doubt that, that Somaliland needs the port, um, but, but even more so Ethiopia, and that's where the population is that would actually support um, uh, the, the, the port itself. But that means roads projects, potentially rail projects, all of these things come with that. You can't just build a port and hope, it to, and hope it's going to work. If there's no road connection to the interior, then you're not going to get very far, right? Now, this brings us to China and East Asia and Japan, okay? Um, China uh, has been a longstanding partner of certain states in Eastern Africa. Um, it has history in the 1970s um, in places like Tanzania and Zambia and Zimbabwe, supporting independence movements, um, building railroads uh, to, from the copper mines in Zambia through to, to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, um, but it was limited. Highly, highly limited. This was this was um, you know height of the Cold War. It was uh, Soviet versus American influence um, in places like Ethiopia uh, with a Marxist regime, Somalia with a Marxist regime that then flipped and became um, a non-Marxist regime, and, uh, ostensibly allied with the U.S. Kenya, an American stalwart ally in the region. So the story of China really begins in the 1990s. Um, and, and then really begins in earnest after 2013 with the Belt and Road Initiative. So, um, you know, President Xi's made visits here uh, to, to Tanzania. Um, warships have called, uh, battleships have called, um, ports made ports have called Mombasa, Dar es Salaam, uh, Maputo, et cetera. And then there's just massive uh, um, Chinese influence, uh, excuse me, uh, infrastructure, um, which I'll talk about that's under the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, all of this has led, similar to the small and medium powers acting in the region, to um, something that's approaching a bit of, 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 of hyperbole. Uh, and that is the fear of encirclement or um, loss of influence and power, particularly by India in the region. Um, and the map on the left here uh, is an Indian map uh, showing uh, all the nodes of power or project, uh, power or, or or um, power projection nodes of India and China. And this concern about being hemmed in in their own ocean, um, which, which, which they see it as, okay? And uh, you'll see Djibouti figures prominently on here, but, but, but actually um, uh, the Indians map is a little bit wrong if they're really concerned about all the uh, um, projects China has in the Indian Ocean region, they should pay a bit more attention to, to Eastern Africa. But the map on the right, basically is saying, look, all of these countries are China's now. The whole continent is basically red with the exception of say Kenya and why Kenya is not red, I don't know, why Tanzania is not, I don't know, et cetera. And it's become a, a, a narrative. It's one I've heard in the United States. It's one I've heard in Japan. It's one I've heard in India. Um, and it's certainly one, even though I haven't been to Australia recently, that is, is very, very rampant in Australia if anybody thinks about Africa in Australia. And so what is it China's doing? Um, well, it's, it's, it's big, um, bigger than, uh, um, you know, these infrastructure projects are bigger than anything since colonial times and actually much bigger at the end of the day. Uh, they built a standard gauge railway in Kenya, um, going from the port of Mombasa to the capital Nairobi and then on into the Rift Valley. They have built a standard gauge railway um, from Djibouti down to Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. Of course, they're heavily involved in Djibouti and the port. Um, and these are just two rail projects of many across Eastern Africa. Um, they're building an entirely new port in Lamu in Kenya, which is pictured here. Uh, so that's north of Mombasa. Uh, many view this as kind of a white elephant project. 
uh, it's a road to nowhere. There's where, where do you know, drop stuff off at this port and then where does it go? Um, uh, but it's, it's part of Kenya's Vision 2030. It's part of a larger project that originally hatched with Ethiopia and South Sudan and Uganda um, over 10, 15 years ago. And the Chinese are building, the, the, this is the, I think the first of three births um, that is going to go in here and it potentially offers Kenya an entirely new port. Um, you know, China's uh, got ports, projects in Bagamoyo in Tanzania, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Um, uh, and it's got all sorts of other projects in places like um, uh, Tanzania as far as gas is concerned. Um, it has interests in Mozambique, et cetera. The list goes on and on. We moved into Uganda or, or South Sudan. Um, China's the major um, oil exporter and oil um, uh, extractor in places like Uganda and South Sudan, et cetera. So all of this leads to this um, conundrum at least that's the way it's viewed in places like Tokyo, where, you know, like the, like, the art, like the article says here, Japan cannot stop China from owning Africa. It's too late. Um, you know, maps, look at this. Uh, you, you, you can't compete with a country like this on this scale. Investments by China and Africa win friends and the trust of nations. Um, you know, this is the, 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 the narrative that's ongoing. And there's, there's something to be said uh, about all of the so-called debt trap diplomacy and the issues of repayment of loans for the BRI um, to Chinese state-owned banks, et cetera. I'm not gonna delve into that here. We can talk about that at um, uh, the break. I'm not a BRI scholar, by the way, so don't expect um, uh, a perfect answers on that. But many of these projects are needed, S similar to the Berber report, similar to the expansion of um, uh, the, the ports in Djibouti, similar to the railroad from Addis Ababa uh, to, to Djibouti, that cut the travel time between Addis Ababa and Djibouti from 12 hours to, I think, no, it was, it was 24 hours to, I think, eight. Okay, again, these are huge distances um, and, and over very difficult terrain, by the way. Uh, and so there's, there is an element, and, and, and one of the things that um, I noticed in, in, in many of these countries is just simply the lack of transportation infrastructure. All right, um, you know you've got breadbasket countries like Kenya that produce uh, um, you know uh, enough food to be a major exporter, and yet so much of that food can't make it from you know, farm to table within the uh, within its own within the country, simply because the transport infrastructure isn't there, and so the food goes bad, etc. And so. Uh, you know, I'm critical of, of, of many Chinese projects. Some of these are white elephants um, uh, in, in, in Eastern Africa. But um, at the same time, I think this level of infrastructure building has been a real win for, for many African states. Okay. Now, let's turn to Japan and what it's done. And forgive me, because I'm sharing my screen, I don't have my notes. I'm not, I'm not reading them, uh, so I, I'm abbreviating a bit here, but we can go into details um, afterwards. Japan's a longstanding partner in Eastern Africa. It focuses on particular countries um, rather than China, which seems to really blanket most countries with the possible exception of Somalia. Um, Japan focuses on Kenya, first and foremost. It has really since the 1960s and Kenya's independence. Um, and it still is the major uh, um, source of, of um, investment and infrastructure building in East Africa. Um, Ethiopia is increasingly uh, is increasing in importance and Mozambique has also um, increased in importance, although we'll talk a little bit about why that might be changing. Some of the big projects uh, at the top here, this is the Port of Mombasa. Uh, Japan Ports Consulting is um, basically involved in a 40 year project uh, to refurbish and expand the port. Um, uh, Kenyan companies and uh, both consulting and construction are building bypasses around Mombasa um, and, and across Kenya. Uh, and this is done in a very Japanese way, a very statist way. Um, you know, there's a, there's the, in a very careful and um, lengthy <laughs> way. Uh, this is the one complaint I heard in, in uh, Africa. And I, it's the one complaint I heard in Japan by the companies that are doing the work is that everything takes so long, whereas the Chinese build it really fast and approve it really fast. Um, sure, the quality is better of the Japanese stuff, everybody says, but if you have to wait 
30 years and you, and you can get it in three, uh, you know, which one are you going to take? We need it now. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's quite interesting. The, uh, so going to the, to the mechanisms here, um, you have a real push since 2015 in this rollout of uh, a former prime minister, uh, Shinzo Abe's free and open Indo-Pacific, a real push to get Japanese co uh, companies out of their comfort zone in Japan and into places outside their comfort zone, like Eastern Africa. Um, so that's, that's something um, that is very, very different uh, from what they're used to. Yeah, there no, there's no problem investing in, in Southeast Asia, for example, they're familiar with that market, um, but Eastern Africa is, is still somewhat uh, terra incognita, except for these big companies like Mitsui and Mitsubishi, et cetera, which we'll talk about. Um, all of this is done generally by state funding, uh, loans from Japan Bank of International Cooperation, uh, loans and funding from JICA, uh, the Japan um, a Development Corporation, um, and so it's safe as well. Uh, uh, you know, I talked to companies in Japan that attempted to do work uh, direct with governments in Africa, and um, the experience had been singularly bad, they said. And so they refused to do work unless the Jap Jap Japanese government was going to pay them. And so again, this, this, is, this is safe. It takes a long time. Uh, the loans that are given to countries like Kenya and Ethiopia are um, the interest rates are extremely low. Uh, they're almost being given away for free, but um, it takes a long time. Okay. Now, further south in, in a place like Mozambique, uh, a company like Mitsui, which is a huge conglomerate, uh, um, has been involved in multiple projects over the past 15, uh, 20 years. Uh, the major one is in Nakala um, on the coast. This is to bring uh, coal all the way from Western Mozambique, which you can see on the other side of Malawi here, um, along a railroad um, to the port facilities, which you can see here. Um, they've been involved in agricultural projects and they've been involved in, in exploration and exploitation of liquid, uh, liquefied natural gas, which companies like Tohoku Gas have already agreed to purchase. Now, um, for a variety of reasons, none of these projects have come to fruition, unfortunately. Uh, the, the coal mining scheme turned into a bad deal because the coal, the grade of coal was only good for burning for electricity. Um, uh, that was not what they wanted it for. That contributes to greenhouse gases. So they would have been selling it to countries like India. Um, uh, and so this is, this is not what they wanted it for. That was one of the problems. The other problem was their Brazilian partner, Vale, um, was having difficulties in getting land grants, et cetera, et cetera, to build railroads. Um, and then as far as liquefied natural ga uh, gas, you may have uh, heard this in March, there was a major um, uh, terrorist incident in Nakala um, uh, by a group called Al-Shabaab, which seems to have some ties to um, Al-Qaeda, uh, ISIS, um, uh, Al-Shabaab in, in Somalia. Um, and basically all this liquefied natural gas, all these projects, whether it's the Japanese or the French or the Chinese, they're all on hold. Um, and so it's one more bullet point or data point that Japanese companies see and say, see, that's why we don't really want to work in Eastern Africa. Now that's unfortunate because it's in North, Northern Mozambique presents, a, um, I think a singular situation, uh, but nonetheless, that's been, that's been a, a wake up call um, for, for the Japanese. Now, one of the things that all the countries um, you know, whether it's uh, the United States, uh, China, um, uh, Japan, I, I think uh, Israel as well. Um, one of the things that many of them are interested in, especially with, with advanced manufacturing industries, um, uh, you know, uh, microchips, et cetera, et cetera, you're looking at rare, rare earth metals. Um, and this is something that uh, has driven uh, Japanese foreign policy for a number of years, but it's particularly acute now that China is involved so heavily in the game. Um, you know, many of these rare earth metals, something like 90% of them come from countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, and the Japanese, like the Chinese and others, are involved in something called resource mercantilism, which basically your, 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 your impetus to go into a place is to get the resources. And Japan's been particularly adept at this, um, using uh, JOGMEC. Um, I wish I could remember what the acronym means. Um, but it's, uh, it's a mining um, and, and, and metals uh, engineering uh, group in, in, in Japan, it's government. Um, 
and they've gone in and they've done both capacity building, particularly in Southern Africa, so, so Botswana, uh, Namibia, South Africa, et cetera, um, as well as um, signed contracts for uh, the mining of not just rare earth metals, but others. And so the Japanese government has actually given them, empowered them, uh, the parliament did this, to actually go in, they have boots on the ground, they can see what's going on and actually sign contracts um, to extract these rare earth metals. And it's been quite successful. At the same time, they're engaging with their local counterparts in engineering um, uh, uh, classes, in um, you know, kind of best practices. And so it's an education as well, working hand in hand with local partners in this. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting thing. And I'm not aware of, of anything on this scale um, uh, that's being done, for example, by China. Uh, nonetheless, um, you can see the, 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 the top uh, graph there compiled by JETRO or the uh, Japan External Trade Organization. I'm um, showing competing firms in Africa with Chinese being by far the largest number. And I think that's likely set to remain the same regardless of what happens. And so this, this is kind of leading me to the end of, 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 of this, of my presentation. Again, apologies for, for lacking some of the details that I would have had in my notes, but uh, I did, I, I'm quite intrigued by issues of power projection and influence and what this means. and and how so many see uh, investment in infrastructure and loan and in, in you know, loan giving, et cetera. Um, they, they see causality between that and, and influence and power. And this really seems to be the driving narrative behind um, what the use of what Turkey's doing or the UAE's doing or what Israel's doing in the region um, and what China's doing in the region. Uh, and so to that end, um, I've been looking at this, you know, for the past what, uh, four or five years now, and I'm beginning to realize that, like any state involved in another region outside its own, China is beginning to get a reputation. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to go so far as say states or people, <laughs> but after all, they are at the end of the day, and um, you get to have a reputation once people get to know you, and they either like you or they don't, uh, and 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 this is part of what's happening with the Chinese success story. And it's part of what's not happening so much with the Japanese. The Japanese seem to have a reputation that's um, been somewhat indestructible. I already mentioned its deficiencies as far as the length of time it takes them and how expensive things are. But um, there's still the ability of Japanese companies um, and consulting firms in particular, especially in niche industries, not big infrastructure stuff, um, to really make headway um, in places like Eastern Africa. Uh, but, you know, there's been a dust up recently. Uh, here's, here's Somaliland again, um, which I'm quite interested in. I don't know if any of you heard of this, but here's two states, Taiwan, which is not really internationally recognized, although everybody does kind of recognize it, and Somaliland, which nobody does really recognize. And they both signed up to get together in, in, in July of last year. And, uh, and this infuriated China. Um, uh, it, just, it just had them in fits. And the Chinese uh, ambassador was up for Mogadishu to Hargeisa insisting um, that, they, that they, they stop this and that they, you know, this isn't so far as, as exchanging diplomats, but they both have trade representatives in each other's country now, um, in Taipei and in, and in Hargeisa. And it was quite a big deal. And so, um, you know, a country like Somaliland, which has been strong-armed by China, um, uh, you know, it, 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 let, let me just say that China's reputation is not really good um, in a country like Somaliland right now. Um, I was interested to see what it was elsewhere, I mean, in a place where China actually has done a lot of work, because it hasn't in Somaliland, it hasn't done anything in Somaliland, and it's done hardly anything in Somalia, uh, by the way. Um, so I looked at Kenya, and I actually did some polling work uh, last year. This polling work started right at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic in January. And I completed it in, I think, early June last year. And I did a survey in Kenya. Uh, I, I tried to keep it to students of politics and international relations at Kenyan universities, but it inevitably got sent to you know, friends and family and whatever else, because I was using a snowball system where, so I could get more people to respond. 
Um, and it, I had nine questions that I asked, and the findings were rather interesting. All of them uh, showed a marked decrease in, um, in positive views of China since 2015. So the questions asked them, you know, how do you feel about China compared to 2015, that, that, that type of thing? You know, what do you think of the standard gauge, gauge railway? Um, does Chinese investment infrastructure in your country, you know, who does it benefit? Um, is it the common Kenyan? Is it political elites? Is it, you know, the, the answer to that was political elites um, by over 80% of the people who responded. And so there seems to be a combination of knowledge of, of, of Chinese infrastructure, knowledge of, of loans, knowledge of secret deals between Kenyan political elites and, and China for, um, say, the, the, uh, the China gets to assume management of the Mombasa port operations if Kenya defaults on its loans. All of these things seem to be conspiring uh, to, to bring about a more negative uh, view of China. And so uh, I'll conclude with this final thought, which is at the end of the day, no matter how um, powerful these countries are, and there's no doubt that China is extremely powerful, um, at the end of the day, the states on the ground in Eastern Africa, given their geographic distance from East Asia in particular, um, but even for countries like, you know, smaller countries like the UAE or, or, or Turkey or others, I mean, it's the leaders of these countries that are going to be calling the shots. Um, and, and so the, the, the impetus for a lot of the movement of external states in the region, certainly there's the interest from that side, but there seems to be a lot of a, course, a, a, a great deal of corresponding interest from the political elites in these countries um, and from businesses in these countries to engage in these types of, of, of projects. And so uh, this, this, this again shows that while BRI might have a lot of negatives um, or some of the Japanese projects or, or some of the things associated with, 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 with Emirati um, uh, investment in, in, in the continent might have some negatives. At the end of the day, they are being done on the watch of Africans and they, are, they do seem to be fulfilling at least somewhat of an interest some of the time. So I'll end there and thank you for listening. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Great. <laughs> thank you, Professor Cannon. Uh, this You're was welcome. A, I think this was a very instructive and uh, interesting talk on, on a part of the world that actually we don't know much about, even though we're relatively close to this area than to East Asia. Um, and well, I've learned a lot and I have a few uh, maybe comments and questions before we open the floor for more questions. So the sure. first thing is um, actually, uh, I think that what, what, you, what you described, if I try to imagine it in my head, is, I, in my head is a kind of, uh, I would say, uh, externalizing East Asian rivalry, especially between China and Japan, uh, to East Africa. You know, the, this, this sort of competition, uh, alliance competition, resource competition, uh, even soft power competition takes place within the East Asian region between Japan and from the one side and its allies and the United States and China from the other. But it looks like it's also taking place in East Africa. And I think uh, in your talk, you emphasized a few of these uh, the component, components of this uh, competition between them, this building up rivalry. Uh, first, uh, competition over resources, and you mentioned it, and this is the most basic thing, right? Uh, both countries need Africa's resources in order to develop economically and to maintain their global uh, economic position, and there is a competition there. Um, a second stage of competition is actually, and you mentioned it, is uh, infrastructure projects. You mentioned the big BRI, but actually both Japan and China are competing on infrastructure projects, not only in East Asia, but also as you, as you showed in East, in East Africa. Uh, and actually one of the people who listen to us, uh, the, the student, her name is Shir Shapira, and she, she writes her PhD on the competition between Japan and China on the high rail railway uh, in, uh, in, in East and Southeast Asia. And it was really interesting that you mentioned it in Africa as well. Uh, another uh, dimension of this uh, competition is, I would say, strategic alliances, right? And you mentioned uh, the boots on the ground. The, the, both China and Japan have a military installation in Djibouti. Uh, they're trying to look, they look at the strategic point of view. It's not only bilateral relations between them, but actually to 
see how they manage to uh, maximize <laughs> position within the I would say collective uh, strategy of the region. And the last thing that you mentioned only at the end of your talk is a soft power competition. And actually it's not only winning the pockets or the resources of East Africa, but also winning the hearts and minds of the people of uh, Africa. And uh, this is an aspect that I wrote a little bit about, uh, which talks about how they try to complement their hard power with uh, some soft power measures. Um, for example, China has invested in the Confucius Institutes, I think something like 300, uh, well, there are, there are about 500 uh, Confucius Institutes in the world, and Africa gets about 150 or 200 uh, uh, Confucius Institutes. Uh, this is one way. Uh, other soft power measure, ODAs, Japanese ODAs, so also there is a competition building up there. Uh, and continuing with this line of thought, by the way, you know, China has a quite a negative image in many parts of the world. Uh, I, I saw a few surveys and actually uh, the countries where China has the least negative image is uh, Norway and Israel. <laughs> <laughs> For all the reasons, yeah. Norway and Israel, all the others, you know, in the United States, in Africa, in, in Asia, there's quite a negative image. And China tries to change it. Uh, for example, in Israel, it was uh, discovered that uh, last year, China gave uh, the Israeli Broadcasting Association something like you know, millions, hundreds of millions of shekels uh, to promote uh, video clips and other uh, TV production to better China's image. So actually, China is investing uh, there too. And the last thing uh, that you mentioned, that the negative image of uh, China in Africa derives from the fact that actually China is kind of collaborating with local elites in order to explo exploit Africa's resources, right? So actually they don't really have good relations with the people of the countries of East Af Africa, but only, only with their elites. And this really resembles what Japan did in Southeast Asia. Uh, up until the 70s, this was the image of Japan. Japan is now one of the most favored nation in, uh, in Southeast Asia, but up until the 70s, Japan has exactly the same image, and actually it uh, exploded when uh, Prime Minister Tanaka Kakue visited Southeast Asia in 1974, where he was faced with huge demonstrations against him. Only then Japan did a switch and, uh, and, uh, and told that uh, it should uh, approach you know, the people of Southeast Asia, and not only their uh, political or economic elites. So I think uh, this, this gives us a lot of food of thought. Uh, let me just end with the two questions. Uh, so one, and I think you mentioned it at the beginning of, of your talk, but I would like to hear your opinion about it, is actually thinking about China's intention in this part of the world. So uh, in, in this sense, we have two, there are two major attitudes. I would say that one, is that China is gradually advanced an aggressive expansion uh, policy, which will end up, starts with the economy and infrastructure and will end up on the political sphere. And some people in Israel think like this, you know, they, they see they have a military base in Djibouti, they have uh, ships, they have uh, investing in the BRI and so on. And uh, so some people think that actually China is pursuing some kind of aggressive long-term policy. Uh, in Hebrew, we call it, uh, a tendency to see uh, mountains shade as if they are the mountains. <laughs> we have this saying in Hebrew. Okay? Uh, while other, another attitude is actually, you know, China is be basically behaving like any country of its size and its uh, global position would behave, you know. It needs to explore further markets. It needs to go up to go abroad in order to maintain its economic achievements. So in this sense, there is no expansion strategy. There is no perception of threat, uh, military threat, threat. China is just doing what any other country or a market driven, economically oriented country would have done. So this is the first question. I would like to, uh, to hear your opinion about that. And secondly, well, I guess kind of in a similar vein is about Turkey. And I was very surprised to hear what you said about Turkey, that opening up uh, embassies from 12 to 40 something uh, in Africa, getting more and more involved in Africa. And 
what interestingly, this is exactly in a time where the Turkish economy seemed to be in decline. So the, the Turkish economy is shrinking, but it's expansionist as no, uh, well, image in Africa is, uh, is increasing. So how do, you, how do you read this? Well, why is Turkey doing that? <laughs> Thank you. Danny, would you like to collect a few questions or let uh, Professor Cannon ask, answer them first? Uh, maybe let's maybe let's collect some questions. I have some questions of my own. Okay. Okay. So let's collect uh, two or three more questions. Go ahead, Danny. Yeah, sure. Uh, first, I have one comment: uh, the hostility or the positive attitude to an economic investor in a country also depends on the competition. And I must say that when I visited Tajikistan. I went through several Chinese tunnels, which were crucial because they connected between cities were virtually the only way through the mountains. China had a relatively positive image, not cultural to the local culture, there were many complaints, but the professional image of China was good because the competitor was Iran. And the Iranian tunnels were way, way worse. So depends who, who is the competition. But I have two questions. First of all, Somaliland. Somaliland, I guess, wants recognition. And you spoke a little bit about it with Taiwan. But do they try to use the competition between the different countries in the region in order to get international recognition from actors except Taiwan? And the second question is COVID-19 diplomacy. Uh, did China try to improve its situation in the region by trying to sell vaccinations, uh, its own Sinopharm, its own vaccinations, or did other countries try to do so? That's my Thank question. you, Daddy. Yeah, okay. So, Professor Cannon, let's go with this, and we'll collect okay. another set later. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. These are great questions, and I appreciate uh, Nissen your your wrap up and in, in, in touching on these key points. Um, you know, whether it's competition for resources, infrastructure, uh, the soft power of China, um, uh, the negative image in Africa of China. Well, look, China's um, not the only country that has a negative image in Africa. Um, the United States has a very poor image in in, in many countries in Africa. Uh, again, there's there's something to be said about this obsolescing. Uh, model of, of the more you invest in a country, the less favorable they view you, the more they get to know you, the less they like you. Um, you know, you, you, you choose sides in disputes and it, it angers people and all this stuff. And so China has been able to avoid that. I mean, many places, it still avoids it in the Gulf here. Uh, it's something we talk about all the time in my classes. Um, you know, China's a good friend of Iran. China's also a good friend of the UAE. Isn't there a problem there? Uh, you know, these, these, these type of things. And so, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's inevitable in some respects, but there's also many, many people, um, as, as, as Danny brought up, you know, look at, look at Tajikistan, much closer to China um, than Eastern Africa is where, uh, you know, the views of as far as the professional or the, the, the infrastructure is concerned is very, very positive. Certainly in a place like Kenya, I've heard this, where, yeah, look, we really like the Chinese to build big things for us. The railroads are great. The big, huge, you know, uh, five-lane highways, uh, six-lane highways, eight-lane highways, they're fantastic. Um, what we don't like is the lower-level stuff. Uh, the Chinese, actually, the way they are in, in Nairobi, for example, the way they treat us. Um, uh, uh, um, we don't want them selling uh, their imported shoes next to us when we're selling our shoes that are also imported from China. These kind of things. I mean, so it's, 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 the, it's the smaller stuff that seems to really... Uh, stick in the craw of, of, of many there. Um, what's China's intention? Is it gradually advancing economically and then it's going to become political? Uh, is, this, is there some grand strategy around all of this? I don't want to fence it, um, but it does seem like China's Belt and Road Initiative has taken on life of its own. And, and, and a big part of, of, of um, uh, the chapter that um, uh, forms the basis of this presentation, the chapter I've written, which will be coming out in this, in this forthcoming book. Uh, it talks about how 
you know, assigning too much credit to BRI and President Xi and, and, and you know, he's, he's, the, he's the guy that's controlling all the strings of the puppet. It just doesn't work. There's a lot of opportunism here. There's a lot of projects gone awry. Um, there's a lot of white elephant projects. And then there's a lot of things that are actually needed. So a Kenyan friend of mine told me when I said, Look, you, you guys owe billions of dollars to the Chinese. He said, yeah, but we have a railroad. I, you know, I mean, look, it, it, they, they need it. It's, it's, it's done some interesting things. Um, you know, the fact that the railroad doesn't move as much freight as it's supposed to is very problematic. Um, and I can go into the details as far as why that's the case, but it's revolutionized the local tourism trade. You can now travel from Nairobi to Mombasa for, you know, a couple of shillings. And I mean, it's affordable for your, for your upper, uh, for, your, for your middle class people, certainly. Um, to travel all the way to Mombasa and have a beach holiday. You know, that was something that, that you know, Israelis uh, flew to Nairobi and then went to Mombasa, Americans did. You know, this other thing, and, and, and many of the locals, you know, it was, it was either an, an eight to 12 hour uh, um, uh, you know, van ride down there or, or um, it wasn't going and, and, and now you can do that. So, um, you know, whether there's this, this overarching strategy, uh, certainly across uh, much of the Indo-Pacific, I do think there's an element that this is just um, this is just China's destiny, uh, um, that China is destined to be the biggest power in the world. And I think in many respects, they're probably right about that. You know, it's the, it's the revenge of history. Uh, um, you know, what does that mean on the ground in places like East Africa or Bangladesh or, 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 or Malaysia um, is, is a totally different story. And I think that's why you're getting the reactions you do um, or, or we're seeing um, with, with quadrilateral security dialogues, Indo-Pacific, um, you know, you, you might be trying to turn back the clock, um, but there's, you know, I think there are, some, there are some legitimate concerns the closer you are to China geographically by countries like Malaysia and the Philippines and Japan um, that do need to be taken uh, into, into account here. Um, my answer about Turkey is, is, is is in some respects similar to my answer about China. Um, you know, Turkey's opening to Africa began in 1995, but it was really under Erdogan's leadership um, that this really took off about 2008 and nine. Um, Turkey's become one of the biggest uh, um, uh, players in Somalia and it, and it really began in 2011. So it's only been there for 10 years now. It hasn't even been there for 10 years. It'll be the end of, end of the year when it's been there 10 years. It started out as uh, humanitarian famine relief. Uh, Erdogan actually visited Mogadishu himself um, in 2011, and Somalia was in the midst of a, of a terrible famine. Um, that mobilized the, the arms of, 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 of the Turkish state. It was a highly coordinated affair to bring famine relief. Turkish NGOs, which you might be familiar with in, in Israel, um, uh, um, uh, came to, to Somalia. This turned into business opportunities. Much of this is tied to Erdogan's um, uh, uh, political clique, his ruling party, um, uh, the hangers on of this. So again, quite similar to, to, to BRI. Um, and this kind of took on a life of its own. Uh, I've written quite a bit on Turkey and Somalia and it seems to me there was no driver at the wheel. It just became something that happened and all of a sudden Turkey ends up uh, for a variety of reasons, um, Turkish companies end up uh, managing and expanding both the port of Mogadishu and the airport itself, which are the two biggest money earners for the government of Somalia. Uh, and so it's become in, in some respects a kingmaker. Now, Turkey, like China, has actually built tangible things in Somalia. And if you're familiar with Somalia at all, it's a country that um, has a lot of people doing a lot of good, but there's nothing to show for it. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure how good it is at the end of the day. Uh, Turkey at least can point to roads and hospitals and, and uh, the expansion of the port and international flights in and out of Mogadishu um, that offer Somalis a way to the outside world via Istanbul, et cetera. Um, and so Turkey's rollout in sub-Saharan Africa, because North Africa is a different story. That's, that's, that's pretty, pretty integral to Turkish um, strategic interest. But um, to sub-Saharan Africa certainly has been Real, uh, a real grab bag of, of, of the same type of things. It's a political visit, a high profile visit by Erdogan, but he brings along his, his business guys. Um, and so next thing you know, Turkish construction companies are building a new stadium or um, building a new airport in Niger. 
um, or Turkish companies are, are supplying uh, armored vehicles to the Ugandans or something. And there's, it all seems to be somewhat coordinated. And at the same time, again, it's, it's a lot of personal ties and taking on life of its own. So uh, maybe this is the way foreign policy is always done. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think Turkey has a grand strategy by any means in the, in the way that China might. Um, I think that it's, it, it's, its economic situation, its political situation have, have, um, have been made it difficult for it uh, to continue this. Uh, that being said, it's one of the few bright spots in Turkish foreign policy. And so um, Erdogan and the Ak Party, uh, the Justice and Development Party, uh, milk that for all that it's worth. So um, if you hear my door banging, it's my four-year-old son, so excuse me. Uh, let's see. Um, Danny, uh, you talked about uh, competition. Yeah, very interesting on the Tajikistan um, uh, angle there. I agree with you that, um, again, it's been quite good for a place like East Africa to have this level of engagement by external states over the past 10 to 15 years. As I mentioned, a lot of this infrastructure is needed, regardless of some of the graft and whatever else that comes with big construction contracts the world over, um, the deals made between political elites um, of different states and back rooms, et cetera. A lot of this stuff needs to be done. And so China seems to be the only country that's willing to build really big um, in a place like Eastern Africa. China seems to be one of the only countries in Tajikistan, for example, that's willing to, willing to build really big besides Iran, which is next door. So, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, um, uh, you know, if we had another choice, um, in Nairobi, for example, uh, maybe that would maybe that would be taken. And I think Nairobi's um, moves recently have shown that they're willing to play the field. So they've given a huge contract to Bechtel, the American company, to build um, or to, to expand the highway running from Mombasa to Nairobi. Um, but the standard gauge railway went to China. But China was the only one, frankly, that was bidding on that. Um, Somaliland, uh, yeah, quite an interesting case, fascinating. Smiley has been trying to get recognition um, for 30 years now. Uh, um, it's worked at every angle uh, possible from um, uh, you know, African Union, uh, um, uh, you know, special investigation on it um, that actually said, uh, we need to recognize this state back in 2005 and then the, and then the report was shelved um, to exploring all sorts of options with countries like Kenya, which have a bone to grind or, or an ax to grind, excuse me, with Somalia. Um, it's just, there's nothing in it for, uh, there's nothing in the strategic interests of many countries to do this. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Kenya can still poke its finger in, in, in Mogadishu's eye without actually recognizing Somaliland and taking the risk. And so it wasn't that Somaliland could only find Taiwan. It's just that nobody else seems interested. Um, for its part, Somaliland has taken a page from Taiwan's playbook and has representative offices in places like Dubai, um, uh, in London, um, Washington, uh, et cetera. And so um, it, it works with those representative offices. But you know, this is a, this is a small, um, uh, a very poor country um, that just uh, hasn't been able to, um, to, to work against the tide. It's, it's an international tide which sees the government in Mogadishu as the legitimate government of Somalia and, um, and, and, and therefore ignores a, a state that's been independent um, for 30 years. Uh, and look, the international system doesn't like any more anarchy than it's already in it. Uh, you know, people don't want to see what happened in, in, in former Yugoslavia happen again. Um, and so there's all these breaks and no special interest group has taken an interest in it like it did in Sudan, finally, South Sudan, um, finally after years of civil war. So until that happens, um, it's, it's, it's a rather unfortunate state of affairs because I think it does have a very good case, both historical, um, not just in the last 30 years, I mean, historical with being separate from Italian Somaliland, being British Somaliland, et cetera. So um, yeah, maybe they should recognize Israel. Let's see what happens. Um, uh, that, 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 might be a, that might be an opening for them. So um, yeah. Uh, let's see, COVID-19 diplomacy. So yeah, again, part of this uh, uh, book chapter in my research, it touches on the, the, the pandemic and, the, and the, the aftermath of that and what's happened um, uh, in places like Eastern Africa. Yeah, China's definitely worked um, on its soft power image there. It's interesting that I see a lot of parallels between what Japan 
did in the 1960s and 70s that you brought up, uh, Nissen, and what China's attempting to do now to, you know, it had, it, it's, it's developing that bad reputation that Japan had in Southeast Asia. Um, and I think China's learning faster um, and has more at its, uh, um, more at its disposal to shift the narrative in its favor. You know, look, it's not just in Israel that they're giving, uh, you know, uh, millions of shekels to, to uh, um, news outlets. It's all over Europe. Um, it's in East Africa. Uh, and, and so, yeah, they are definitely working on, on their image. And so the aftermath of COVID-19, there's a big push to bring all sorts of uh, PPE and, and masks and things. But there are also scandals at the same time. Um, you know, masks being hoarded in Kenya to fly to China at the beginning of the uh, pandemic. Um, you had the situation uh, uh, in China itself where, where uh, African exchange students and others were attacked um, in March of last year by Chinese because they were thought to be asymptomatic carriers of COVID-19. I, I mean, you know, just kind of this, this crazy stuff. And so COVID-19, not surprisingly, hasn't helped China's image um, in Eastern Africa, uh, no matter how much they've tried to push back against that narrative. I must add, Brandon, that when in Tajikistan, the most common complaint that I heard about the Chinese experts and engineers, and that connects with us Japan people, that they don't remove shoes when they enter houses. <laughs> For Tajiki people, it's just like in Japan. It's yeah. like the epitome of rudeness. Yes. Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I didn't realize, like, well, they would have... Uh, the, the Chinese better not go to Turkey either, because that's one of the cardinal rules there. You take off your shoes. So yes, and of course the Japanese. My goodness, my landlady in Japan. Uh, I thought she would have she would have stuck a knife in me if I'd walked across that floor with a shoe on. So yes, uh, yeah. it's very interesting. It's very yeah, again these cultural things, and and so this is this is part of the problem. Is that you know there's there's the image of the ugly American out there that's that's rampant around the world. Um, and there's the there's becoming the image of the ugly Chinese. I mean, when I was there, when I read, there was a scandal involving a a restaurant, um, a Chinese restaurant in Nairobi that uh, um, closed to Africans um, in the evening, uh, and and it, it, the, the scandal blew up because some of the reporters from the local newspaper went to eat there, and they were turned away at the door, and it turned out that the the restaurant turned into a massage parlor in the evening and it was only Chinese Westerners and Kenyan political elites who were allowed. So anyway, it turned into a big scandal. Uh, and so these type of things don't help. Um, yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. This is really fascinating. Great. Uh, are there other questions or comments from the audience you'd like to share? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so um, actually I, I did write uh, some things here and um, um, following, following yeah, what you mentioned, I, I did, I did some, so some articles actually arguing that um, um, in difference from the com common view that uh, China exploits uh, Africa and other parts of the world, you know, Sri Lanka and so on, um, so maybe it's the other way around. It is being exploited, like you mentioned. You know, they're building things there, and uh, uh, and, and the basis, the the military installation is actually, well, first thing is for piracy, but other is actually if they need to rescue Chinese workers from Africa. So I think I saw some uh, publications uh, about uh, that as well. But I was wondering about uh, the security dialogue. Uh, if we look at um, well, again, I go back to East Asia, but I think you can extend it across the Asia Pacific uh, and, uh, and even East Africa. If you look at developments in the field of economy or infrastructure, they are taking place very fast. You know, they're very uh, swift progress. But if we look at the, the, the security dialogue, which you are expert in, it, it really takes a lot of time. And actually we don't see so much changes, you know, uh, and um, so actually I was wondering uh, if you can uh, talk a little bit about that, about that. How is the building contestation or situ rivalry in East Africa um, influence on the wider security dialogue? Well, 
foremost between the United States and its partners? So this is uh, one question. And here another question that I got from uh, Shir that uh, we, see her, we see her here addressed in a kimono, but she, <laughs> she, she's, uh, she's, uh, yeah, she's uh, in a place with a really bad reception. So she sent me by WhatsApp. Uh, you talked about how African countries are being written about as if they don't have any choice regarding projects and showed mostly red map of Africa. We also know that China bought a large portion of Africa debt. I'd like to ask, what do you think about the political control of China in African countries? And if, it is, if you think the BRI ends up helping China in gaining political favor in them? This is a Shields, Shields a question. Thank you. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, those are great. Yeah, so I, I, I might, you might have mentioned, uh, she might have missed the, my, the beginning of the uh, presentation, but um, I, you know, I did mention that this, I've, I've written articles on, on the agency of Africans and how they engage with these countries. And at the end of the day, if you're missing that part of the picture, you're not gonna get very far. Um, uh, and so I realized this presentation appeared to be all about external states and them acting in Africa. Um, but obviously uh, this is, this is a, um, a two lane, a uh, highway, um, very much so. And at the end of the day, as I mentioned towards the end, it's the Africans who are going to be calling the shots in their, in their um, sovereign states. Uh, so first of all, um, the security dialogue question uh, or the security issues uh, I'm involved, there's no doubt that Africa is generally viewed through a security lens from Washington anyway, um, and which is, which is in some respects unfortunate, uh, but you know, the overall distributions of power in places like the Western Indian Ocean, um, they haven't changed significantly. Uh, you know, this, you know, as much as we talk about China's development of Blue Water Navy um, and its larger military, et cetera, et cetera, this is not a, um, a, a military that's, that's, that's um, going to readily have, um, uh, be setting up locations in the way that the United States has, um, whether that's in, you know, the, the Fifth Fleet in Bahrain, Aludade in Qatar, Diego Garcia, um, troop presence not only in Djibouti, but also in Lamu and Kenya, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, you know, the, the U.S. is a resident, it's, it can be considered a resident power in the Indian Ocean. Now, there is something to the, what I termed hyperbole, of Chinese power growing in places like Africa, with Djibouti being used as the, uh, as, as, as the case um, that's, that seems to have galvanized interest in in Washington um, about what this means and how it, uh, the United States, along with a country like Japan and India and Australia um, and others uh, might react uh, to this. Um, so far, what I've seen hasn't been A, coordinated between them and B, it seems to be uh, kind of trying to beat China in its own game by using the same playbook. And I, and I keep referring to this chapter that's gonna be published, but. You know, this this, this formed the basis of my uh, um, presentation tonight, and I argue strenuously against that. Um, look, this doesn't rise to the level of national security concerns of any of these countries, um, uh, nor should it. And uh, at the end of the day, it is uh, the Kenyans and the Ethiopians who are going to make the decisions about this. And if they want the Chinese there, then, then, then by all means, they'll be there. And if they don't, they won't. Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, some of the stuff that's coming out of Washington now, um, and certainly some of the things I heard in Tokyo, which were so worried, wor you know, these worries about this in Eastern Africa um, appear to be rather uh, misguided. Um, so on to the, the second question, if I remember it correctly, we're talking about, um, you know, the, 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 the map I was showing of, 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 of Africa being basically painted red um, is, is one of those maps that I use um, it's, it's quite hyperbolic. Um, it's, it's meant to shock you into thinking, oh my goodness, the, you know, the, the, the sky is turning red, um, you know, the, the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and you know, a lot of these think tanks are putting out pieces like this. Um, uh, and it, it, these in general ignore uh, the role of African political elites, at least in what's going on on the continent. And they also ignore the fact that many of these states are looking for this infrastructure and no other state has come offering to build it, okay? Um, this is again where you see um, a, some similarity between Turkey's actions um, and China, although Turkey's is, is, is much, much smaller, of course. Um, you know, in the construction sector itself, you know, Turkey's building railroads in Tanzania now. 
Uh, Turkey's building airports uh, in Niger, like I mentioned. And so uh, smaller scale, but there's still that um, uh, a need, or at least the political elites see a need, um, and, and therefore the contracts are won and the, and, and the projects are built. Um, political elites can change their mind. Uh, Paul Kagame uh, famously kicked the Chinese out of uh, Rwanda um, as they were building a stadium in Kigali uh, and gave the contract to a Turkish company. So, you know, again, there's choice here. Um, and there's choice in a way that I would argue there hasn't been um, uh, um, for a very, very long time, if ever. And so, um, uh, you know, despite the issues of debt and all of that, um, uh, that, the, that the West in particular likes to talk about with China. Uh, look, the African states are in debt to the West and China. Um, and uh, many uh, Africans will point that out. Uh, Kenyans will point that out. Look, yeah, we might owe more overall to China than we do to the IMF and the World Bank, et cetera. But at the end of the day, it's all the same thing. Um, and at least we've got a railroad now. So uh, I think, that, I think it's, it's a very mixed picture. It's a very nuanced picture. And you're not going to me, find me falling on on one side or the other necessarily as far as this is concerned. I think overall China's role in Africa has been positive thus far. Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks a lot. And if I remember correctly, I think there was a Chinese involvement, I, I would say back in the 60s and 70s in East Africa, right? Uh, during the Mao, yeah. Mao time, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's yeah, yeah, some kind of history of uh, involvement. Yeah, they built the railroad uh, from, from Dar es Salaam to uh, the Zambian copper mines. It's uh, still, still operational, and I think they're supposed to refurbish it because the railroad, of course, is quite old now um, and decrepit. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, a history of, of China um, supporting, uh, you know, African socialist governments like uh, um, near areas, Tanzania, um, certainly assisting with weaponry as far as uh, anti-colonial struggles, et cetera. So there is a history. It's just, it's just limited because it was just, uh, you know, back then it was the height of the Cold War, as I mentioned. Oh, fascinating. Really, really fascinating. Thank you for the answers and, and for this presentation. And actually, I can envision some kind of um, a continuation of this dialogue. Uh, now that we know better about your research uh, interest and your, uh, the scope, uh, the wide scope of your knowledge and expertise. Uh, we have a few people who can actually accommodate some of the things that you're talking about. For example, uh, if you're thinking about uh, decision making uh, towards uh, the political economy of Africa within China. So how does it actually work within China? Uh, we have a scholar we just, who just joined our department. Her name is Tamar Ozeri whose expertise in the Chinese uh, state-owned companies. So actually ah, this relationship between, uh, yeah, this is, uh, her, this is her PhD and uh, she, she does a terrific work on this. We have a few people working on East Africa and we have a few international relationists also doing the work uh, uh, which, uh, which is close to what you're doing. So um, I'm always thinking about future collaboration opportunities and I, I definitely see them here. I'd Actually, we yep. have in our department, we have a traveling seminar, which is oh. always themed. It's sometimes business or Japanese business related. That's right. Yeah, we, we have a traveling seminar, yeah. Usually about history and politics. Yeah. It's to follow Japanese investments. We may Japanese investments in Eastern Africa. I would definitely, yeah. I would definitely like to do it. And actually, absolutely. Next, Next, actually, next year's seminar uh, will be on the SDF, the Japanese Self Defense Forces. This will ah, be the well, theme of the seminar. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is fascinating. So, one of the one of the things I've got in train right now is is the uh, I did all sorts of research when I was in Japan as well on Japan's conversion of its uh, of of its fixed wing, excuse me, of its helicopter carriers to fixed wing fighter carriers and the and the retooling of the SDF. So. I would love to participate in that. Um, wow, wow, yeah. wow. Okay, okay, terrific, terrific. I remember that. That, that, that should be coming out in Asian security soon. Uh, oh, really? I'm the, okay, I'm doing, okay. Revision, I'm doing the revisions now, so. Please send, please send it to me, I'll include it, I will include it in the syllabus. <laughs> Fantastic, yeah. So, no, I'd love to participate in any of this. And, uh, and obviously, if uh, uh, there's a chance to get together again, um, you know, you're most welcome here in, in, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I'd love to come to Jerusalem. Uh, or in, in Tokyo or wherever it could be, um, do keep me in mind and, and, um, and I will certainly do the same, of course, for you as well. Thank you so much.